Hi, it's Arjun. With what will be the final Super Spiked of Summer, we will return after Labor Day. And with a back-to-back video, I was going to write this up as a quick post, but as I was putting some of the pictures together, I thought the voiceover uh, would make more sense. So back-to-back videos here. I wanted to go through really three key themes to address the question of where are we in the cycle for especially traditional energy equities. And Most importantly, I think we are still early in a new structural bull phase for returns on capital. We've talked about return on capital cycles being 10 to 15 years up, 10 to 15 years down, 2006 to 2020, a very tough period, especially the last five or eight years of that. I think 2021 marked the inflection to a new bull phase. And here in 2023, even with sequentially lower oil prices, I think we still feel pretty good about the types of returns on capital and profitability the industry is is putting up. I think we may be early, uh, and it's still early, of the market starting to move past the idea that oil and gas is a sunset industry. What would make it a sunset industry? The idea that oil demand in particular was going to peak either you know just before COVID or within the next few years, or even perhaps it could level out next decade. Some version of that the market is broadly believed that there's going to be an imminent peak uh, defined as within the next several years in oil demand. And I think we're on track to obliterate this type of fear. We can always level off or have issues around recession. But when you look at the significant needs of the other 7 billion people in the rest of the world, something I've written about the previous four weeks or, or done a video on, the, the ultimate needs are massive. And you combine that the idea that we're nowhere near the peaking of oil demand with this notion of more than acceptable profitability, I think this should give a new lease on life to the sector and that it no longer gets viewed as sort of a sunset industry. But I think we're still early in in that worm turning. And it it might take a few more quarters, even a year or two, to fully embed a a better long-term outlook. I think the last point we want to make, and maybe this impacts the previous point as well, is the idea that at least as it relates to the oil macro, I still prefer, we still prefer this language of super vol over super cycle, um, at least for now. And that could change. And maybe I'll wait to get into it, uh, but still super vol over super cycle. So I'm going to go through about 10 graphs here. Uh, the first one is uh, we're going to start with the, the profitability. And so this is a graph I've shown before. It looks at WTI oil prices relative to return on capital. And it's really that relationship. How is profitability holding up relative to a given level of macro that we are most focused on? Oil and gas and all these commodities are volatile. It's not about having a straight line up. It it is about overall generating better levels of profitability. And I, I would just say in this kind of picture, staying quote unquote above the regression line. This regression line is the previous kind of bad five-year period of 2015 to 2019. And you can see uh, from a peak of 2022, uh, it was about a 35% return on capital, maybe a little bit higher and $108 oil. We've actually had four straight quarters of sequentially declining oil prices. And while cyclically, that has been a headwind for the sector, I take a lot of comfort from a long-term perspective that overall returns on capital, as well as returns on capital relative to oil prices, have held up pretty well. Uh, here in the second quarter of 2023, we're just below that sort of mid to 50, you know, that 15% kind of level. I think we are seeing some of the effects of lower gas prices, both globally and the US come through in these second quarter numbers. But oil has gone down from 108 to 73. That's what, $35 a barrel. And while returns on capital have sequentially fallen, I'd still call this overall very acceptable levels of profitability. And if it turns out, and we don't know for sure, But if it turns out that we had seen that low in oil in the second quarter of last year, I think that is a more than acceptable, at least near-term low for return on capital, especially in the context of the previous 10 years. I wanted to look at that same graph though a second way, which is latest 12 months, so rolling four-quarter averages. And here, I think the results are even more powerful. Look at this upper right quadrant. These are the last five quarters of LTM or trailing four quarter returns on capital. And so despite all the volatility going up to 110, back down to, I think somewhere in the sixties, we're now, where are we on the screen today? We are uh, E79 dollars on WTI, 83 on Brent. Uh, trailing 12 month returns on capital have generally been above 20% for five, for five straight quarters. And one of the questions is when do investors start believing this? 
Um, it can take as long as several years, maybe three years, for investors to really buy into um, the outlook that profitability is doing better, to see some of the ups and downs, to see how companies hold up, not just coming out of the COVID trough and a little bit of the benefits there, but really over time, there's been a little bit of oil field cost inflation and such things. Yet profitability, again, I'd say feeling really good about where we are, continue to believe that we are early in the new structural bull phase. These things are usually decadal long in nature. And we've had sort of five quarters or maybe two, almost two and a half years of, you know, at least improving and five quarters of very good returns on capital. I think we've got a long way to go in the good part of that very, very long-term return on capital cycle. I will note, because I think you have to put up the numbers as you see them, net debt uh, for the last couple of quarters has ticked up a little bit from the low point uh, two quarters ago. It's a little bit of some currency movements for some of the foreign companies, a little bit of acquisitions, and maybe a little bit of the shareholder distributions ramped up. And as oil come down, you get a little bit of a, uh, a negative free cash flow effect for at least some companies. And there's some working capital movements for some of the bigger guys as well. And as a reminder, on both the return on capital and net debt, this is a universe of 75 to 80 publicly traded companies, clearly very North America exposed, US, Canada, uh, major oils, NOCs, uh, excuse me, IOCs, major oils, EMPs, refiners, uh, smattering of oil service guys. It does have the European majors in there as well, but about 80 companies overall uh, make up both the return on capital and these debt charts. I think the final point as it relates to profitability is this idea of CapEx still being very much uh, in control, well below what I've called danger zone levels, which uh, would have been the 28 to 2014 period. This graph here is billions of dollars of real or inflation adjusted CapEx, and it's relative to five-year forward demand view. So to some degree, we've actually seen that 2023 dot uh, be a little less steep. It's flattened out a bit. Some of that is a little bit better of that long-term demand outlook, but a chunk of it is that CapEx actually isn't um, expanding as maybe as quickly as we would have thought even uh, six or 12 months ago. Some of that is due to the pullback and all prices is going to help keep CapEx in check. And some of it is sort of a, a better discipline, if you will, than, than even I, who've been pretty positive on returns on capital, thought was possible. At the end of the day, companies are going to have to take risk. I think if the demand outlook is as good as I think it will be over the long run, we are going to at some point need uh, greater spending. But so far, uh, at least as it relates to any questions about profitability. I think people feel should feel really good that the capital spending numbers remain well in control. In fact, it's we're not even anywhere near uh, those historic danger zone kind of levels. So uh, let me uh, now switch a little bit to uh, this idea of sunset industry, industry getting re-rated or not, and where are we in sort of that type of sentiment and dynamics. And this is a chart, it's just simple stock price performance. It's the iShares Clean ETF. That's the yellow line, the S&P 500, the bluish aqua blue, I'm not sure what color that is, light blue line, uh, the S&P 500 in that orangey kind of color, and then the XLE in white. And from a starting point uh, of just before COVID, uh, the beginning of the year, 2020, we go through COVID, traditional energy gets annihilated. Uh, you can see the big run clean energy had uh, that peak for clean energy in early 2021 does coincide with the inauguration of President Biden. Sector actually peaked uh, plus or minus right around the inauguration day. And since then, um, over the last now almost, uh, what are we, one, two, three, three and a half years, traditional energy, clean energy, as it's called, the S&P 500 oil have all done about the same. Uh, if you throw in dividends, which we should do, and we do in a different chart that I'm not showing here, uh, traditional energy is outperformed by a little bit. But uh, over the context of this period, uh, you're kind of back to even. You've made up the lost ground. That's at least step number one. Fix your profitability, fix your balance sheet, uh, and get back to, I think if we were if we were do, using a sports analogy, your team's back to 500. You know, you've won as many games as you lost. You're back to break, break even against uh, these other important indices and sectors. I will stay say, still say, though, that over much longer periods of time, this goes back to 2015. You can go back further. Traditional energy, which is still that white line, uh, is badly lagging everything. Uh, it is still lagging. That's that iShares clean ETF. Uh, and it's lagging all the bubble stocks out there, Tesla, 
Um, the ARK Innovation Fund, which has come under a lot of pressure, is still significantly outperforming traditional energy on a long-term basis. And that top line is actually Bitcoin. We, we don't have views on Bitcoin or, for that matter, even some of these bubble stocks specifically. It's more just to point out that while energy has recovered off those COVID lows, it is still lagging uh, on a long-term basis. And I'd say it goes back to that point of a lot of perceptions at the sunset industry that demand is going to peak or plateau and ultimately roll over at some point. Concerns that profitability was kind of a one hit wonder in 2022. Uh, and maybe it's going to normalize back down to those lower levels as the sector is able to uh, move past those concerns. And we'll see how much longer it takes. But as people gain confidence in rest of world traditional energy, oil and gas demand, and as people gain comfort in the uh, returns on capital. I think there's a lot of room for this sector to continue to regain lost ground, especially over the long run, not just make up lost ground as it's done over the short term. I think the final point along these lines is, and this is a graph you've seen it before, of return on capital. It's the blue line on the left axis versus energies weighting in the S&P 500, which is the gray line on the right axis. And you can see there's a general relationship there. When the sector is more profitable, it's weighting in the S&P goes up. Uh, and then when the sector uh, profitability goes down, the weighting goes down, it was as high as 12 to 14 percent just 15 years ago in the kind of 2007 to 2010 period. And of course, it troughed at just around 2 percent at the depths of COVID. We've seen a dramatic, but perhaps too dramatic and too quick rebound and return on capital from losing a bunch of money uh, at the COVID trough to having a record year in 2022. And with the return on capital having pulled back, We've seen some easing in the sector. It's S&P weight got over 5% uh, last year. It has pulled back. To, I think it's right now it's about 4.5%. But what does that tell you? That tells you the market, I think, recognizes that the worst of the 2015 to 2020 period is behind us. We're, we're not back to 2%. We are at 4.5%. We're up off those lows. On the other hand, it clearly doubts, the market clearly doubts that any sort of mid-teens return on capital uh, is at all sustainable. Again, we're talking about the sector here, right? We're talking about the sector. Over 100 years, it's going to be a cost of capital return on capital. But within that 100 years, you go through 10, 10 bad years and 10 good years, plus or minus. We're currently, we think, early in one of those good periods. The market doesn't believe it yet. The market still thinks we're going to revert back to the bad old days. And as you disprove that, I would expect this S&P energy weight to go up. I think it's my views. I think my colleagues at Veriton share this view that energy will get back to a double digit weighting in the S&P 500 uh, before this cycle ends. And I think that's, again, still many years away. So let's talk about oil demand. And again, I spent the previous four weeks talking about this. I, I think I'll just say this to make a few quick points. Um, there's so much focus on the 1 billion people the lucky 1 billion, as I've said, who are consuming 41 million barrels a day or 13 barrels of capita. And what sort of hit or uh, offsets we may have to that due to electric vehicles or at some point fuel economy gains. And listen, is it possible 41 million barrels a day of rich country, the lucky 1 billion uh, people on earth, US, Canada, Western Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, is, is it the potential for that to get? Yes, of course there is. Could that 41 in an extreme case, get the 30 million barrels a day in the context of, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years, something like that. It's possible. What we have been focused on is really, how do you meet the energy needs of those other 7 billion people on earth? 59 million barrels a day, just three barrels per capita. These two meet at about the 10 barrel per capita mark, which I do think is possible. It would imply, would imply 120 million barrels a day of eventual oil demand growth in the rest of the world. That is an insane number. That is not our forecast. That is not a projection. It's meant as an order of magnitude point. I also don't define a time frame to that. So it could be over 80 years. It is the idea, though, that we know modern energy exists and there is going to be an inevitable march of progress for the least fortunate among us, and they deserve it. That is justice. It is social justice, it is environmental justice, and it's economic justice. But it could take a long time. Uh, we're going to need, we're going to absolutely need a whole bunch of new technologies so that oil demand does not grow, because I'm not sure it can grow by 120 million barrels a day. It's a ludicrous number to even say it out loud, right? It's a ludicrous number. 
you're going to have to have some of the other stuff scale. And maybe not all those countries get to 10 barrels per capita. Though again, I think there's an inevitability towards progress that will happen. The point I'd say, though, is when you look at that upside from the rest of the world, it dwarfs whatever hit you think might happen to the lucky 1 billion of us in terms of our oil usage. Uh, I'm not sure that 41 is really going down that much. But again, I accept the fact that you can paint some not crazy downside scenarios of the 41 could go to 30 by 2035 or 2040 or 2050, whatever, whatever year. It's not about the year. It, it, it's, it's about these order of magnitudes, uh, increments of oil demand, possibly negative in the rich countries, but overwhelmingly positive in the rest of the world. And all of this, by the way, we should recognize that today, today we're still in a world where China, Europe, and US all face uncertainty on the economic front. So we're obliterating these peak demand concerns at a time of generally choppy GDP. I will say though, it is the fact that GDP is generally choppy for why we are not in an environment where we say super cycle and why we prefer super vol. We've not shown yet that you can have oil go up and not have some negative hit to demand like we did in the early 2000s where oil price went up and oil demand actually accelerated into it as the emerging markets, in particular China, went through a significant growth phase where they didn't care what the oil price was. They were going to be developing their economies. Their economies were able to withstand higher oil prices. And you had sort of an up and to the right for both demand and oil. We're not in that environment at this moment. It's a big reason why we say the long-term outlook for demand is actually quite constructive, but we're not in an environment where you can dissociate price from any demand impacts. And again, it's why we prefer super vol over super cycle. Now, I do think we have to be mindful of the fact that the cost curve is steepening. And this is work that my former colleagues at Goldman Sachs have been doing for 20 years. I used to contribute to it. It's always been spearheaded by my, my former colleague and, and friend, Michele De Lavinia, who uh, was, I think, a junior analyst at the time we published the first one, and he did the bulk of the work on that. And as a senior person, he, him, him and his team continue to publish it along with their global colleagues. But since 2017, when you had the flattest oil curve after years of shale resource expansion, if you just go from right to left, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, I mean, we're now in kind of year five or six of the cost curve steepening, which means fewer projects and increasingly higher cost projects for the ones that remain. And we've not seen these two elements bite yet, if you will. So far, we the oil price has gone up. We probably have moderated demand a little bit. And whatever supply we have had between remaining shale growth and some non-shale growth that we saw, especially uh, over the last 12 months, uh, places like Guyana, some Brazil, uh, that type of stuff, um, you've been able to get by without a big ratcheting up at the long end of the curve. And I think that's what I'm just going to close with here, which is so far, back-end oil has been quiet. So this is spot oil in the white graph. Uh, it is uh, 60 months forward oil. Did I have that right? Yep, 60, the five-year forward price of oil in that purplish, light purplish kind of color. And you can see that light purplish has been pretty range-bound of late. Even uh, in 2022, when oil spiked to $120 a barrel, yeah, you had a little bit of rally in back-end oil, but it's been pretty well anchored. And I think that is reflecting a combination of lackluster economic data. And again, the idea that, well, if oil spikes, it just means demand is going to come down. A big difference, again, I've said it a few times now, a big difference from 20 years ago, oil went from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60, all the way up to 100 and beyond 100. And you, know, you had a quintupling of oil prices. Uh, and demand overall was either accelerating or doing well into that. That's We've not seen that yet. We, we, we haven't quintupled the oil price, <laughs> at least not versus some $50 kind of pre-COVID, you know, previous five-year type of average. Um, I think it's coming. Uh, you know, I, I do see that a super cycle is possible, but, but we're not there yet. Uh, and so long as there is great uncertainty about China uh, and Europe and to some degree the United States, these are the three largest oil consuming regions. I think it's going to be hard to fully morph back and rally uh, until you get more confidence or whatever the right phrasing is towards a more sustained economic improvement. Or it's that other 7 billion people, especially the folks in India, uh, the people in the 54 countries that comprise Africa and other parts of Southeast Asia. Do we get a, a, up another S curve in some of those areas? 
like we saw China catalyst uh, catalyze the 2002 to 2008 period, we, we've not seen that yet. We're seeing growth. Uh, the growth, though, for us so far has been um, more moderate. I don't know if that's quite the right word. Uh, it, it, it's not been as unbridled as it was in China uh, 20 years ago. Uh, you know, And so we've been able to meet that short-term supply demand with either price, spiking prices or, or then with the pullback that we're seeing right now. And again, that's why we have preferred, and hopefully I'm being clear, the super vol over the super cycle language. I mean, this will always be sort of a lagging indicator. I'm not suggesting we can foretell that the back end is going to rise, but I think we will know that that supply uh, steepening of the cost curve and or demand is doing better. When that when that really starts to crunch, you're going to see it in, in back end oil like we saw uh, 20 years ago. So I'd like to end this video on a personal note, and I'd like to talk about pronouns. And no, do not worry. We are not trying to delve into controversial culture war issues, but I have gotten the question, Arjun, I've noticed that in the last few issues of Super Spike, or maybe the last few months, you started to use the phrasing, we uh, project this or expect that, or us or our projections or forecasts. Who's the we? <laughs> we thought it was just you. And I, I, I think it was, I think it's worth clarifying. I have switched Super Spiked from being an I to being a we, us, our. That is the pronoun shift that I am here to explain. Nothing else. Um, when I started Super Spiked, I wanted it to be very clear that these were my personal views. I am on a board and an advisory board and have a bunch of different affiliations. And I didn't want there to be any confusion that I was somehow uh, speaking on behalf of any of my affiliations. I'm not. I wasn't then and I'm not now. Uh, the, the, the companies where I'm fortunate to have board or advisory positions, they have their own spokespeople, they have their own CEOs or heads of school or heads of organizations, whatever the case may be. Uh, and these are therefore the views of Super Spiked. But in joining Veriton, we are a team. And so while I am the lead editor or author of Super Spiked, um, we are a team. And I benefited greatly from my colleagues at Veriton. And so the we, us, and our refers to Super Spike now being part of the Veriton flat platform. So I hope that clears up any confusion. I know pronouns are a tricky topic today, but at least as it relates to Super Spike, that is the basis for the change. And that's it. I hope everyone has a great rest of your summer and we will see you after Labor Day. Thank you.